a century on from the end of the First World War. We honor their memory. But the war is just part of their story. Discover your family. Unravel your history. At findmypast.co.uk Today I will be joined by a panel of Find My Past experts who will be introducing you to a variety of different historical resources that when combined will allow you to build a full, rich, detailed and colourful picture of your ancestors' lives. And first up, I will be joined by Estelle Carr from our search team who will be explaining to you why birth, marriage, death and census records are the keys to unlocking your family's past. When Estelle is done speaking, she'll be joining me here live. So if you have any questions about birth, marriage, death records or censuses for that matter, get them in now and Estelle and I will try our best to get through as many as we can before we're joined by our next speaker. So without further ado, I will leave you with Estelle as she talks you through these really valuable records. So I'm here to talk about births, marriages and death records and census records. Birth, marriages and deaths, or BMDs, um, are a really good place to get started. In fact, both of them, when you combine the two, it's amazing what you can discover. Uh, I started my own family tree about 20 years ago, and I was really interested because my grandma, her maiden name was Goldstein, and I wanted to find out more. So the first thing I did was I found the index of her birth. Um, so we have birth indexes on Find My Past. I found the index of her birth, and then I ordered a copy of the certificate. Um, and of course, the day the birth certificate arrives was amazing. Um, so I opened it up and I found the name of her father, which was Mark Goldstein, which I never knew. And it told me he was a master tailor and it told me where they were living and the name of her mum. And that was it. I was off and running with my family tree. Um, so the information you get in these records is, is really quite useful. Marriage certificates are also incredibly useful. Obviously, you'll see the names of the spouses, their ages, where they were living. Um, you will probably get the names of their fathers and their uh, father's occupations, which, which is great. Um, and again, it's really useful because when you're tying all this information together, you know, family history, I always say it's like a jigsaw puzzle. So, you know, you, you can write it down and go, okay, well, this is what it said in the birth certificate. This is what I've got in the marriage and this is what I found in the census. And you're sort of joining it all up and finding the sort of the common patterns. Um, and, and it's great. And, and honestly, the excitement when you get your certificate in the post, even now, I got one a couple of months ago um, and I found out a new occupation was a dairyman. And I was like, delighted, it's great. Uh, death certificates as well, they're really useful. Uh, because it will tell you the cause of death and also who registered the death, which you know may well be a family member. So again, it's great for piecing together. Oh, and I did forget to add that on marriage certificates, you also get witnesses. So again, it helps piece together. You know, that could be friends, it may well be relatives. Um, you know, it's really good, all the information that you get in them. So then we move on to the census returns. And I have to say, I think these are probably my favorite records out of everything uh, just because you can sort of do a story of your ancestors life you know find where they were when one census was taken where did they go 10 years later were they married did they have kids you know what were they doing and, and it's a great way to sort of follow their journey the censuses were taken every 10 years and um, in, in, uh, for England and Wales, the 1911 census uh, is actually handwritten by the householder. So that's fantastic because you're seeing your ancestors' handwriting. Um, and again, it, I still never cease to get excited by that. Censuses give you an awful lot of useful information. Uh, you'll see who they were living with in the household at the time the census was taken. It could be a spouse, it could be their parents, you could see children. Sometimes they have in-laws staying, which so if you've got the householder and it will say mother-in-law, that may well be giving you his wife's maiden name, so you don't need to order a marriage certificate. There's lots of tricks of using censuses to match up with birth, marriage and death records. Anyway, that's enough from me. Um, I think it's probably time that you watch the video and see how to do it. Begin by searching for your close relatives with basic information such as their name, year of birth and a location relevant to them. 
Start with a broad search and then narrow it down. Search one or two years either side of the date and also search by county or town when you're searching for your relative's location. When you click search, a list of top level results will appear. These represent all the people we found in the records that match your search. If you get zero results, click edit search and broaden your criteria. For example, covering a wider geographical area, then try again. If you think you've found the person you're looking for, click this button to be taken to the record. All of your discoveries can be stored safely in your family tree, ready for you to revisit later by clicking Attach to Tree. Remember, the more people you add to your tree, the more hints we can generate. Thank you for that, Estelle. And um, you've just okay, lost sure. your poppy, by the way. Your poppy's oh. just fallen off. <laughs> um, so now we have Estelle here uh, live and in the flesh. Um, and we're going to try and answer as many of your questions as we can. Can I just say, Alex, you look very smart. Thank you very much. And yeah, can I just you... say, I'm sorry, I mispronounced your surname before. It's... That's, that's all right. It's okay. Carl, not Carl. It is. Are you trying to give Miko a run for his <laughs> I think so. so um, but in the interest of time, we've had quite a few questions in already, so cool. I think we should dive straight in. So the first up is from uh, John Chapman. Thank you very much, John, for sending this in. And John has said, I always seem to have issues finding my relatives on genealogy websites. This is a good question for you. <laughs> what features does Find My Past have that make this easier? OK, well, so quite recently, over the last year or so, we've actually um, added some really cool stuff on our search pages. Uh, so one will be if you start typing a location, um, it will autofill it in for you. Because we did find that a lot of people actually might misspell something because you don't really know how. Yeah, it's to, easy or to it's do. very easy to do, you know. Birmingham becomes Brimingham and so on. So we've done that. The other thing we did, which is so cool, is that as you start typing, um, the search button gives you a result count so you can see how many results you're going to get. So if you're on that form and it says no results found, you know that you need to change something in your search. So I find that really helpful, actually, because it yeah, gives me a I bit of too. a clue. You know, if it's saying thousands, <coughs> I know I've got to refine my search a bit more. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've added some related records. So when I search and I view a transcript, so say, for example, I find my granddad's birth, civil birth, um, and we've also got Lincolnshire Parish Registers. What we do is we match, we, we take the information from that record and then we match it with our other records. So it will show okay. me a match for like Lincolnshire Parish Baptisms, which has got my granddad. Now you find this related records feature on every single transcript on Find My Past. Every single one? As long as we've got a match. If okay. we haven't got a match, you're not going to see it. But otherwise, it will be there no matter what you're searching. Um, and it's so helpful. I find myself clicking through and clicking through and just finding really relevant information. So that, as well, is definitely worth looking at. And I know you, in your in the video you recorded earlier, you, you talked a bit about hints and military hints. So yep. I, re related records are particularly useful for those who don't actually have a tree. It means yep. they can still take advantage. Yeah, absolutely, because it, it works on a very, very similar principle. Um, you know, we know that not everyone wants to build a tree or keep, wants to keep their tree online, and that's fine. So it's there when you're viewing transcripts. So, um, yeah, it's great, definitely worth using. Great. So uh, we've got another one from Nicola Bradford. This, mm -hmm. is, this is quite a nice, easy one, actually. <laughs> uh, Nicola's asking, how far back do British census records go? So the first census was actually taken in 1801. Um, and we do have some of the earlier censuses, but they, uh, were, sort of, they were lost and destroyed. And There's not, only fragments surviving, I think. Just tiny bits. Like we've got Corf Castle, I think. For, I've lost my poppy again. <laughs> for 1790. Um, uh, but the main ones that we've got start from 1841 um, for yes. the UK and go up to 1911 for, Engl or for England and Wales. Um, and then with the US census, they actually um, are a lot more recent. They're not, they're not controlled by that 101 year rule. So it's um, 1940 is the earliest, uh, the latest rather, oh, okay. for the USA. So, um, yeah, so we <coughs> cover quite a wide range of years. And of course, censuses are great because you, you can map that journey for your ancestors and you've just given me uh you've just inspired me to do a quick plug for another record set you oh, worked on actually because as you were saying then the u.s census has got up to 1940. Yeah. obviously we don't have that option in the uk because no. the 40s oh of course yes so uh, electoral registers we yes that's correct so we do have uh, the electoral rolls um that's the collection that spans from 1832 to 1932 and we've done some really cool work on that um which uh we've uh been reprocessing it and making it much more searchable. And so from 1920 to 32, 
then uh, it's really easy to find your ancestors in there. And we are continuing that. So we're going to start processing further back at the other yeah. years as well. Because really, I guess that's the only available way at the moment of tracking your ancestors' movements after military, so after 1911. Yeah, Which, of absolutely. course, the census is end before the war. Well, that's so, right. Yeah. In fact, they gave me a really good clue because I found my ancestor um, uh, living with someone, and I'm like, hang on a minute, that's not his wife. Oh, his okay. wife died. Yeah. Turns out he'd remarried. Oh, and you I had never, no idea. I had no idea. Oh, wow. And this was so, through the electoral registers? Through the electoral censuses. registers, yes. Oh, wow. And so, because then I thought, oh, perhaps he's remarried. <coughs> found the civil marriage, ordered the certificate, and there you go. So, that, so, yeah, it's really, really helpful. Definitely worth looking at. Oh, great. Well, I've... This is actually a question. Oh, no, sorry. We do have uh, a good question here from Linda James. I was going to be selfish and ask you one of my own. <laughs> but uh, I'll, 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 I'll read out Linda's instead. Thank you for this, Linda. Uh, Linda said, I have a, a four times... No, three times great-grandfather and grandmother born uh, circa 1800. Can't find their births. Supposed to be born in Ireland. They had children, some born in England and some born in Ireland, according to UK censuses. But now I'm completely stuck. Any tips? Oh my word! That I is a hard to, I might one. have to reread that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, uh, what I would do, what I always find useful, actually, Linda, is to try and order certificates if you can to see what information you can gain from there. Um, have you tried looking at the um, at the children, finding the children as they map through the census as well? Um, sometimes you'll find that they'll have other family members living with them. Yeah. It might be like a grandparent or an auntie or something which can give you a clue. Um, failing that, I mean, we do have quite a, a, a good Irish collection on the site. We do. Of course, all the, a lot of Irish census records no longer survive. That's so. right. And we've only got the recent Irish census. 1901 and 1911. That's correct. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and I think this is quite a common... For people who find Ireland as a place of birth and UK census yeah. often struggle to That's get right. back across. That's right. But we've got the Irish Catholic... Ba Baptisms. We do, yes. Yeah, so definitely worth searching in there. Um, and one thing you should be aware of is when you're searching those Irish records, sometimes the names were actually logged in Latin. Oh, of uh, course, One of my yeah. colleagues who's based in Dublin taught me that. Um, and so you, you might want to do like a, a fuzzy search or a wildcard search just yeah. to see. But definitely for me, I would say have a good look at the census, have a look at the actual image as well to see if it can give you, sometimes it does identify it like a county okay. as well as just Ireland. I guess the, the, so that can help you narrow it down. The tricky thing about this one as well is it sounds like they came over to England as children. It does. So if they were adults, there are quite yeah. a lot of other census substitutes for Ireland, like Patty Sessions records, yeah. Dog's license, dog licenses Love that you know that you might. You know, this is a very good That's one. Great. Uh, you probably do have a good chance of finding them in their adult life yeah. in there because they capture so many people. Yeah. But obviously, if they came over as children, yeah. that is trickier. So but, I think you're right. I think, I think just, looking yeah, for a, scour every census, look at the actual image. Have a good look at the uh, locations there of where born and who was living, because that's that's how I've sort of found clues with things. The transcript doesn't always give you everything, so definitely look at the yeah, image. Yeah, always look at the image. I will echo that 100%. Yeah. Um, so we've got another question saying, uh, this one is from... Oh, sorry, am I? I've, I've lost the questions. I'm oh. just going to get them back up again. <laughs> sorry, bear with me, guys. This is live after all. Here we go. Technology, yeah. I know, I know. Sorry, it's, it is failing me now. <laughs> uh, t -t 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 -t. Sorry, guys. Um, so the next one yeah. is from a Kit Marks, mm -hmm. and he is asking any tips for searching for the relatives of, of military ancestors in censuses. So of course, I, I guess if your ancestor was stationed in a base somewhere, yeah. would their, I'm, I'm guessing what he's asking here is would their ancestors be recorded in a census? I mean, sorry, their immediate relatives with their children, their wives? Oh, that's a good question, and that's something I probably can't answer. Well, I have to ask Paul Nixon. Um, that one we'll save that one expert. for Paul when he comes back up. So, um, oh, I think I think actually that is all we have oh, time for okay. questions now. Great. Uh, do not fear this. Estelle is not finished. Estelle will be jumping if you don't mind. That's Thank right. you. Uh, Estelle will be jumping. You, you, you will indeed. Estelle will be jumping into the comments now to continue to answer any questions you have yeah. about these records. So please do keep them coming in because Estelle will continue to answer them. So all thank right. you very much, Estelle. Thanks, thank Alex. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, I'm going to be joined by our next expert, our very own uh, Miko Cleland, who I'm sure will be a familiar face to many of you. And Miko will be introducing you to the wonderful world of historical newspapers and explaining why there probably isn't a resource out there quite like them in terms of the sheer amount of detail and colour that you can add to your research. So, here's Miko. <laughs> Hey 
any serious family historian will tell you that although records are really, really important for getting hold of the names and dates that you need to build a family tree, family history is all about stories. And you can't find a better place to get hold of these stories than newspapers. If you think about this in a roundabout way, when I give you the statement, the baker's wife died, that's useful for our family history and we can take advantage of that and add it to our tree. But if I tell you the baker's wife died and the blacksmith next door died of grief, that's a story. And that's something that we might be able to find through newspapers. And that's really what we're looking for. Newspapers can give us all kinds of different details from obituaries to military information to details of special events in town, schooling, uh, anything that might be out of the ordinary, life events like a marriage or a birth or baptism, and much more besides. These are the place to get much, much more detail. Without newspapers, especially these local historic newspapers available on Far My Past, I would never have found out why my great-grandfather was sent home from the front in World War I, and he was sent to recover uh, after the effects of being gassed in the trenches. He spent six months recovering at home, and at that picture I also found a photograph of him in his uniform that I'd never seen before. These photographs are common, and you can really understand a little bit more about your ancestors, possibly even looking into their eyes for the first time. But this project of newspapers, of almost 30 million British and Irish local newspapers and national newspapers from almost everywhere you can think of, every single county in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and uh, further afield also in the Channel Islands and more, uh, only comes about through the work of many different people who work very hard, very long hours to make sure that you can search at the touch of a button and uncover your ancestors. With this video, we're going to take a look at exactly what they do, how they do it, and then maybe we can get a bit of an insight into what we do next when it comes to finding those names and getting hold of those all-important, powerful, magical stories. How do newspapers like these get to people like you? They go on a journey, which starts here, at the British Library in Yorkshire, England. The newspapers are retrieved from deep storage by robots. They're taken to the Find My Pass scanning studio just around the corner. The Find My Pass team unloads and assesses what conservation is needed. Then the scanning process begins. It's a painstaking and detailed task. Our expert team then checks the scans to make sure that no errors have been made and no pages have been missed. This may be the last time human hands will ever touch these newspapers. Once we have a collection, we send the digital files up to Dundee in Scotland, where Catherine's team takes the files and specialist software converts the images to digital text. The final files are then checked and uploaded to the website. Find My Past then publishes the records, which means that you can search hundreds of years of newspapers and have millions of stories from the past at your fingertips. For Find My Past customers, this means that all this information, all this detail, all this context of people's lives is accessible at home. Thank you for that, Miko. No Thank problem. you very much. Newspapers are genuinely one of my favourite resources, not just on our site, I think, in the whole of family history. So Fantastic. I imagine you're going to get some quite good questions coming through. Um, so in the uh, yeah, I'll dive straight into them in the interest of time. So the first one we've got in is from Margaret Bull, uh, who said, how do I print out specific articles from the newspaper pages on Find My Past? So when you get a newspaper page on Find My Past, we give you the whole thing, which is kind of important. You can get a bit of idea of context and uh, you get a flavour for what was going on at the time and a little bit more around. So uh, the article you're looking for will be highlighted, but because you've got that whole page, there's a little thing that you can use with Windows called a snipping tool. And you can just type it in your search bar and it gives you a little scissors and you just drag around the article that you'd like and just save it and you can do that. Or you can just crop in something like Microsoft Paint or something like that, which comes with Windows as well, just the article you want from the page that you download, and that's possible as well. 
Great. So the next one we have up is from Paul Stark. Thank you, Paul, who said, how often are, news, not, are new newspapers added to Find My Past and what is the best way to keep track of which ones are added and when they are added? They're added daily. Daily? There's thousands. Oh, wow. There's a, maybe oh, more than 100,000 pages a week added to the British newspaper archive. There's almost 30 million now. And that's growing so fast. And there are records you know, from everywhere you can think of. So it's hard to keep track and especially perhaps if more newspapers have been added from somewhere else that yeah. might still contain your ancestor uh, so go to our sister website the british newspaper archive the collection of newspapers and find my past and the british newspaper archive is the same so um, you're not losing out and find my past but on there they have a section of recently added titles and you can have a look at the year range you can have a look at the titles that are included and the coverage they have and that way you can keep <coughs> Not only of records even added in that day, but you can see records added for the last 30 days and go back and take a look. And if there's something that sounds like it's your kind of area, that's the one to check out. And also, actually, I'm going to do another plug here. If um, it, also we, you, I'm sure many of you are aware that we release new records every single week, and we send out our Find My Past Friday emails. We have a latest record section of our blog page. Each week we also include a full list of all the newspapers that have been newly added to the collection and existing titles that have also been given a, a bit of a, a zhuzh up, so to speak. Um, and actually, you, what you were saying then is maybe think of another question. So you're saying, you know, you can go up and see whether it's your area. Mm -hmm. What do you do if your area, that the coverage just isn't quite there yet? The papers from your county or town are still waiting to be digitised? So there is at least one newspaper from every county okay. in England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. And if not, that's okay because a lot of newspapers syndicated their yes, content. Of course. So there are articles that you'll find all over the country. Um, details I was looking for something in Dumfries just recently, which is somewhere in the Scottish borders, and I found articles in Liverpool, in Cornwall, in Devon, in Wales. And so just look for your town, look for the things that you're looking for, so the names, the events that you're yeah. trying to find, and you may find that these things are reported quite far afield. Great. So um, another question from James Moores here. We've got <coughs> any, sp any specific terms that he should be searching for when looking for stories about his military ancestor? Obviously, he knows the name, but are there any specific words, phrases, basically general search tips, keywords that he should be looking for? I think it depends really on uh, what you are looking for. So it's very difficult to give you a set of exact terms. But think about how something will be written. So if you're looking for someone's name, say, you know, Richard Sharp, it may be listed as R Richard Sharp. Sharp. It may be, I, I love mean, Sharp. <laughs> that's a little in joke, I think, for us. Uh, but uh, it, it could be listed as R Sharp, it could be listed as Mr Sharp, it could be listed in a few different ways. It could be listed perhaps if you had a middle name, Richard T Sharp, and that might not be there either. So think about the name and think about using different combinations. Uh, sometimes they may even only be listed as uh, the husband of the deceased or in other, other sort of descriptive terms. So think about addresses, <coughs> think about more details that you have, perhaps look for their regiment, perhaps even if you have uh, a soldier's number, although they're not as often used, so you need to think more about their names. Um, but try and uh, play around with the terms that you're using oh, okay. and hopefully then you'll still get to these things, but they could be listed in so many different ways. One thing I spotted the other day actually was that um, sometimes including the names of maybe their parents or wives might help as well, because you'll often get, say if it's a report about a specific local soldier, it'll say Private Arnsdale or something, mm -hmm. the son of local publican James Taylor or something, yes. living at such and such address. So searching for their parents' addresses or names might actually bring something back that you weren't expecting to find. Um, sometimes even just use the surname and work from there. If Do you the think it's better to start broad and kind of narrow down as always. you go along? I think if you get five or six results, then that's perfect. If you get too many, start adding in extra words perhaps adding the location, adding something that will just keep narrowing that down until you know yeah. that you're looking at a manageable number of records to look through. And look at them all. Even if it doesn't seem like it could be right, perhaps once you read it, you'll see that actually that's exactly what you're looking for. Great. So uh, next up, we have a question from Pat Lismore, who said, I believe my grandfather went to prison several times for petty crime around the 1920s. His name was James Fox from Dublin, Ireland. Any tips on how I should go about searching newspapers to find out more? Kind of depends on the sort of crime that they may have been sent to prison for. If it was more serious, then it will definitely be in newspapers, and it will definitely be in a number of newspapers, not just the local newspaper. Uh, the good thing about newspapers when we look at court records is that prison records and court records tend to just give you the bare facts. Yeah. This person went to court 
They were found guilty, this was their crime, this is their sentence, this is the witness, etc. If you look in a newspaper, you'll get sometimes a full account of what the witnesses said, what the defendant claimed, uh, details of the crime itself, and this really, really helps to fill in that story and give you the extra detail that you need. So start looking in the local area that you know that things have gone on. Start looking not only at the time of the court case that you know about, but look at the time when the crime may have taken place. So see if you can go back maybe six months to a year as oh, well okay. and don't run those oh, yeah, out I as well. That before, actually. And then don't be afraid to go further afield. And if it's a, a bigger crime, then it probably definitely will be in other newspapers as well, not just the local one. Yeah, you find you find crimes committed in Australia reported about in small Irish papers and things it's like that. It's often Quite because surprising. people from that place in Australia may have relatives ah, in the I home see. place as well. So that's also, sometimes you may find them in a, an international newspaper and we have a large collection of American newspapers as well that are worth looking at Definitely. and they're on far my past. Great well I could quite happily sit here and talk about newspapers <laughs> for another few hours but I'm afraid we do need to be moving on That's so right. as, as with Estelle before him Miko is not running off Miko will be jumping in the comments will and will be continuing to answer your questions so I'm sure there are more questions about newspapers but please do keep them coming in because mm -hmm. Miko will be on hand to answer as many as he can so it's now time for our last expert another familiar face our very own military expert Mr Paul Nixon who will be introducing you to the incredibly rich trove of military records are available on Farm My Past. So here is Paul. Hello. Uh, well, military records on Farm My Past. What a, what a fantastic place to come to look for your records. We've got 60 million of them. Um, so where on earth do you start? Well, you, you start on the search page of, of military and you enter the name of your soldier or the regiment or his number, uh, any number of fields to see what we have. And um, we've got records going back to 1660, we've got records going up until the Falklands War, but obviously now at this particular time of year in 2018, I suppose most people's focus will be on the First World War, looking for grandfather or great-grandfather um, ancestors who served in that conflict. And we have records from National Archives and from other independent license source. So together those add up to 60 million records across service records, pension records, attestations, medal cards, you name it, we have it. And you're more likely to find records of your ancestor on Find My Past than you will on any other site. I'm talking about soldiers, but of course we have uh, airmen's records, uh, so Royal Flying Corps, Royal Air Force. We also have naval records, we have merchant navy records, and you'll find information in those uh, service records as well. Not as much because they tend to be across one or two pages, but you will fi still find information there. As a military historian, I spend hours looking at military records and I never tire of doing so. But even, even I sometimes run into brick walls and Find My Past recognises this and we've tried to make it easier for people by providing hints for military records. And this video, which is coming up now, will show you all about military hints. In order to show you the richness of these records, uh, we've created a family tree for Albert Ball. He was born in 1896 in Nottingham and he was a World War I fighter pilot and England's leading flying ace. Um, among the medals he was awarded was uh, the Victoria Cross um, and the Order of St George. So I've created a tree with Albert's details. I've added in his mum and his dad and you can see that um, I'm getting the orange circles which indicate that we've got hints with our records. So I'm going to click through. We're going to look at uh, one of the hints for um, Albert. So uh, it's the one that's the third one down that really interests me, which is the British Royal Air Force officers serving service records. So I'm going to review the hint. It's looking good so far. On the left hand side is the information in the transcript for the record. And on the right hand side is what's in my tree. I can see that the date of birth is an exact match. So it's looking good. Um, I'm not going to accept it straight away. But I'm going to go through to this page, which uh, these are the details that I can merge over. But just to be sure what I'm going to do, and which I do all the time when I'm accepting hints, is I view the actual record. So there's a link at the top that says view transcript. The transcript is the data that we have transcribed from the image. Um, this is great, it's really helpful, it's giving me uh, some information that I knew already which helps me think, okay, this is probably Albert. It's really, really important that you view the actual image as well because we don't transcribe everything. Some of these records, particularly with military records and the service records, are multiple pages. 
So we can't transcribe everything. Go through and view the image. Uh, this is going to hopefully help me make sure that I've got the right record. This is the first page of Albert's service record. At the top I can see the details that we've transcribed, which are his name, uh, his date of birth. But it's underneath, which is actually quite exciting. Um, it tells me the name of the person to be informed of casualties. Now, from building the tree, I know that Albert's dad was also called Albert. And we can see here that the name of the person to be informed is an A ball. So this is starting to match what I know. Um, on top of that, just um, across from there, it gives me his address. Now, this is some information that I didn't know. It also tells me the relationship is his father. So again, this is all starting to piece together. Family history is like a jigsaw and it's starting to piece everything together for me to go, yeah, I think this could be the right person. Thank you very much, Paul, for joining us. And thank you very much for uh, that video you recorded as well. As, as the subject you're talking about today is military records, I imagine we've been inundated with questions, so I think we should probably just get straight to it. So the first that we've had is from Claire Lynch, who has asked, I think my ancestor's first World War service record was one of the ones that was burned. What records can I look for instead to find out about him? Anything else that can provide me with similar, level, similar levels of detail? Um, good question. Uh, probably not si similar levels of detail, um, but you'll certainly find detail in metal records. So you'll find uh, metal index cards, which we have on Farmer Past. You'll find, um, which will give you the detail of the regiments that the man served with overseas. So you'll get, if he um, wasn't an officer, you'll get his number, you'll get his regiment, um, and possibly the date he served overseas, if he was serving before 1916. If he was an officer, sometimes that date's on there as well. Um, we've recently published um, mili uh, medical records in oh. series MH106, so if he was wounded, you stand a chance of finding him there. There's, a think, a million records in MH106. Oh, wow. So, so quite a lot. Um, if you think, probably six million men, British soldiers, served overseas, there's one million there. So you stand yes. a one in six chance, possibly, of finding him, and, and many men were, were wounded or gassed. Uh, newspapers we've talked about, haven't we? Um, we have regimental records, we've got Scots Guards records. Um, so those records were not among the series that were burned. So they, were they, they stored they, somewhere? Were they stored in a separate record? Yeah, the guards, the guards had their own records. So, that, ah. so five, five guards regiments uh, and then the machine gun corps, guards machine gun corps, all those records were separate, so, so they survive. So if, you're, if your ancestor was in the guards, in the Scots Guards, you'll find them on Find My Past. If he was in another guards regiment, Depending on which regiment, the guards might still have them at Wellington Barracks, but I think some of those records are being accessioned by either the MOD or National Archives, I'm not sure. Oh, so they are moving, not our way. And of course, tragically, I guess it's, it's, it's probably a lot far easier to find your World War I ancestor if they didn't make it home, if they, if they, were, if they were killed. Yeah, of course, you'll find um, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, you'll find soldiers died in the Great War. Um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of sources for, for, for dead soldiers, unfortunately. Yeah, too many sources. Too, yeah, too many indeed. So the next one we have is from Nikki Pearson. Thank you, Nikki, who said, I have my great-grandfather's discharge papers, but haven't found any other service records or medal records. So I think she's also looking for attest attestation and that kind of thing. Would it, be ac uh, would it be because he was discharged in 1922? He served with the Royal Irish Regiment 2nd Battalion. Yes, it will, it will be. Why, um, why would that be? Because men are serving after 1920, their records are still with the MOD. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, so, so um, I mean, I get asked this question all the time. If your ancestor was in the army, if you, if you can't find him in records, remember, many men joined up in, in uh, 1919 as well. Ser serving servicemen were enticed back into the army with bonuses. Because oh, you really? had, in 1919, you had mass uh, demobilisation. There was a worry that, you know, how do we staff the garrisons in India, in, oh, in, in yeah, Africa, in Egypt? You know, how are we going to fill, fill these places if everybody is going to be de demobilised? So there, was, there were incentives to encourage men to uh, enlist again, and they got bonuses. They got cash, cash bonuses, quite generous bonuses. Oh, and wow. so it's possible that some men did that and then continued. They could sign up for one year, two years, three years, yeah. um, but some would have continued on. So if they served beyond 1920, the MOD will be the place for the records. Oh, so you'll have to write off and write, ask to write off. So, so Google, go to, go to Google uh, Veterans UK, and you'll find uh, an MOD website. I forget, I forget the actual address, but Veterans UK, and there's a section there on obtaining service records. Uh, and this is actually my own question because this has just got me curious. So, how often? Obviously, the hundred-year rule is changing every year that passes. How often are these records that have been held back? Are they being digitised? Will they be coming online? So, if um, 
if Nikki waits mm -hmm. till 2022, is there a chance that she'll find her grandfather's records online? Well, no. Um, th that would be a huge project. It would be subject to you know, contracts between the MOD and, and, and whoever. Well, I guess you know, the records in the normal course of events would be accession by the National Archives, but it, but it was a massive project. So, so the advice would be to not wait for that point in time, to go straight ahead and, and just contact the MOD. It costs £30. Pounds. Um, there's two forms you need to fill in, one form about yourself and where the records are to be sent, okay. and, and then the second form is about mm -hmm. the man. And, and how, so, how closely do you have to be related to the person? Is it quite... If, if the serviceman is uh, deceased, um, then you don't need to be related at all. Okay. But, but if the per person is still living, then you do have to provide... So them if them you're things. looking for World War II service records, yep. then you probably have to be a granddaughter or a son or something yep. like that. Yeah, all, all the instructions are on the site, so it's, oh, okay. it's quite easy to find out. Uh, well, this question is one I know you'll be able to answer because it's, I believe this is an area of, uh, obviously all things World War One are an area of interest to you, but I believe this is a specific area of interest. Uh, Marriott or Fret has asked, Marion or Fret, sorry, sorry Marion, uh, my grandfather was killed in action in World War One. We've never seen a photo of him. Uh, obviously we've already talked about newspapers, mm. um, but do you have any other suggestions of places to hunt around for military photos? Uh, yes, there, I mean there are, there are millions of photos that would have been taken in, in the first yeah. world war. It wasn't it wasn't part of the official attestation process, so you didn't need to have photo ID when you joined up. But soldiers, of course, went to studios. Photographers were not um, not averse to taking advantage of an opportunity and would you know go go around camps uh, to take photos of men. So that so there were many millions of photos taken both here and and overseas. Um, actually, finding the photo with the name on the on the back is, is the yeah. trick because m many of the photos, you know, you, you, you take a photo now, Alex, go to a studio, you're not necessarily going to write your name on the back of it. No. So, um, and that's what you're left with. hundred years on, who's this person standing in a jacket and a poppy? No, it's, it might be Alex. Alex Cox. Who knows? Um, but anyway, in terms of finding photos, um, I was at the Imperial War Museum yesterday. Imperial War Museum, good partners, good friends of ours. Um, lives of the First World War, uh, fantastic site. And I understood. I might might have got these figures slightly askew, but. Around seven and a half million records on lives of the First World War. Two and a half million pieces of information added to that site oh, wow. since, since it was launched. Now that might not mean um, a third of records are, are covered because yeah. people like Wilfred Owen might have two hundred pieces, two thousand yeah, pieces added to course. his particular record. But um, but it's a great site to go to to look for photos of ancestors, and it doesn't just cover army; it covers navy and covers air force as well. Um, so so lives of the First World War is, is definitely one. Google searching, honestly, is is another one. Just just Type in the name in Google. The, the, the more unusual the name, the better your chances. Um, my own site, British Army Ancestors, has photos. Yes, of course. Yeah. So that I set that up because I was, people were asking me, uh, how can I find photos of ancestors? And I wanted something where you could easily add a photo and easily search. So, so that's that's only been online for a year. Um, there's other other websites as well. I think World War One photographs. They may not again be named necessarily, but lots of photographs on there. So, would it ever be worth contacting the regiment they served with? Would the, is there, would it, what, what would be the possibility of there being like a survival regimental photo of all of them lined up? You might be able to pick them out. I think there. I think it's a good chance. I think you should uh, take all those potential uh, leads. So definitely contact regiments. So for us with the Honourable Artillery Company, for instance, we know we've digitised some of their photos. Scots Guards have photos which we haven't digitised, so there could be photos there. Um, Try, try um, all these sources. I mean, there's, you've just got to keep um, putting out as many feelers as you can. Yeah. And the other thing that I've suggested in the past uh, when I've been here, uh, and which I've put on one of my blogs as well, is think about setting up your own blog, setting up your own oh, web, yeah. uh, single page website. Very quick, very, very easy, very cheap. You could probably do it free of charge for that matter. And your website would be covered in the keywords. You know, it's Paul Nixon, Essex Regiment, one, two, three, four. And then, then let the search engines do the rest, you know, over time. Don't expect instantaneous results. But I, I've had some great results, actually, from people who've picked up on something I've written in a blog post, might be five or six years ago, and I've had on two occasions, actually, for the same ancestor, whose name is Iliff, Alfred Iliff, unusual name. Yeah, yeah, I've not come across Iliff ever, I don't no, think. No, um, but, um, well, there's an Iliff newspaper group, actually. Oh, wow. So, so it's oh. Uh, not related. But, um, and people have found this name Iliff and then contacted me with photos. So, so definitely, definitely worth, worthwhile exercise. Definitely worth doing. You've got, yeah, I mean, the thing is now, because the internet and the, and the, power, of, the power of the search engines, let that work for you, yeah. you know? Um, because you can keep on checking, and you should keep on checking, but let them come to you as well. And you, you've just reminded me as well, to kind of, this, is my, this is my time to appeal to, to the audience, as you were mentioning lives. Uh, if, if any of you watching have photographs or, or you know, any other inter interesting documents that relate to a military ancestor, do upload them to Lives of the First World War. It doesn't cost anything, and when it, when, I think it, the submissions end in March, don't they, next mm -hmm. year. And you can be part of this permanent digital memorial that will be preserved for countless future generations. So if you have a story that should be up on there, 
get it up before, before you lose the chance. So I think we've got time for a couple more questions before we sadly have to say goodbye. Um, so here's, we've got a question from Joe Murphy who said, how would one go about searching common names in military records? Civil documents show my ancestor was an army pensioner, but no service number is listed. What should I do? That is a tricky one. Yeah, it is a tricky one because uh, unfortunately records that survive are incomplete. So you, you know, the Luftwaffe destroyed 40% of the First World War records, the MOD bureaucrats destroyed records before that. So it's a tragedy. It's though, a, it? it is a tragedy, but you know what? it is what it is. Um, you just need to be persistent. If you have uh, free access to file by pass or paid access for that matter, you can just <coughs> do the laborious progress, process of going through record after record after record. But, but it can be, um, you might never find a resolution actually. If, you're, if you've got a common surname and there isn't a surviving service record and, and you don't know his number, yeah. then you might find several Sidney Smiths or Alex Coxes for that matter. And you don't know whether it's Alex Cox from the Durham Light Infantry or Alex Cox from the Northumberland Fusiliers. That's the thing, the, the service, because my surname is hardly unusual Cox. Mm. So when I was looking for my, 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 my father's grandparents who both served, I, again, I, I had to go through so many because there was. So, there were, I think one of them was George Cox, and you can imagine there were thousands of George mm. Coxes in the army at the time. And it wasn't until I found his att attestation that had his parents' address that matched what I'd found in the 1911 census. It was like, finally, that's mm. him. But as you mm. said, if those service records haven't survived, you're in a bit of a pickle, really. You aren't are. You? I, mean, I, I would say um, speak to relatives. Uh, you know, if you're on speaking terms with your wider family, speak not, yes. not just not just the siblings, obviously, and, and, and parents, but uh, widen the search. I, I had a good success with my great uncle Jack Nixon, who was killed 100 years ago in, in October. Um, his niece in Canada uh, sent me his dog tags, uh, oh, wow. which, which had been found in a button box, and wow. uh, and that was a contact That's... through my through my dad, who was a, yeah. who, was a who was a cousin. Uh, so so ch so check that out. These, these things. Do possibly exist yeah. somewhere in families, so it's worth. I, worth guess, spreading I, net. I guess that's an important thing to remember as well, isn't it? That while the war itself isn't in living memory, the lives of your ancestors will have been within living memory for some members of your family. So you're in a you're in a unusually fortunate position that you can actually possibly ask people who directly spoke to these people and remembered them and what they were like. So I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, so this one is from Linda Devi, and this is, this is about a different war, okay. uh, but obviously Remembrance Day covers all, all conflicts. Uh, she said, I found my granddad's World War I records on Find My Past, and while going through them, I made the chance discovery that he also served in the Boer War. I'd love to learn more about his service during the Boer War. Any tips for finding this out? Tips for finding out Boer War service. So um, if he was in the same regiment, um, there might be a record for him on, on Find My Past, or may, maybe serve with a different regiment, different number, so try that, try some different searches on Find My Past. Uh, there are medal rolls in W100 as well, oh, okay. which is at National Archives, um, and you can search for those medal rolls and it will tell you a little bit about the man, his medal entitlement. So for the Boer War, uh, Queen South Africa medal was the campaign medal, he might have got the King South Africa medal as well, and there'll be different clasps for the, for the Queen South Africa medal. So you'll get some information there. Um, again, newspapers for Boer War. Lots, oh, lots, yes, lots of information course. in the Boer War as well. So yeah. <coughs> by the time of the Boer War, you got to that period where you know everyone with a bit of money was producing a newspaper, so you've mm. got so many to search for f through as well, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think, sadly, looking at the clock, I think that is all we have time for, despite the fact that we've got loads more great questions coming through. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how you're doing the time, but will you have the chance to have a quick look yeah, at the sure. comments Happy maybe to. answer yeah. a few? Happy. Well, thank you very much. So yeah, before, before we go, I'd like to extend a huge thanks not only to Paul, but also to our other experts, Miko and Estelle. Uh, we, and thank you to all of you as well for tuning in and participating and sending in your questions because you guys make it possible. Um, we hope you leave us feeling inspired. We wish you every possible luck in your future research and hope you really have learnt some tricks today that are going to help you break down those brick walls and piece together the lives of your, your military ancestors. If you have enjoyed today um, and you'd like, like to see more, we do do a much smaller version of these broadcasts every Friday on our Facebook page between 3.30 and 4 p.m. Um, Miko, Paul and Estelle are all regular guests, so do tune in um, and th th there'll be much more to come. So just thanks again, and before we go, I'd like to leave you with something that we're quite proud of here at Find My Past, and I, I, it's a real privilege to share this with you. It's a video we made after exploring our collection of historical newspapers. While going through our local papers, we were quite stunned to discover thousands of really touching personal 
per personal tributes written by grieving family members of soldiers killed in action. They come in the form of poems and short tributes. They're very powerful and they serve as a really stark reminder of the true human cost of the war. So we will leave you with that. Thank you again for joining us. Take care and goodbye.